Welcome to the Point of No Return podcast, a show at the intersection of technology and strategy. On this show, we interview industry leaders and experts to better understand how they think about strategy during this time of exponential progress. Bonjour, welcome to another episode of the Point of No Return podcast. Today's show was a bit special for me. I had a really good conversation with Sergey Savchenko and Martin, my business partner at PNR. We've been planning this for a little while, so I was happy to get everyone in the same room. Uh, we had a debate series about a topic that is top of mind today, uh, which is artificial intelligence. And we really wanted to do a deep dive session to uncover what's real, what's fake, what is applicable you know, for businesses today and really kind of going at a deep business slash technical level. And I was really happy with the outcome. Uh, a bit of background on Sergey. Sergey until recently was a technical director and executive producer at Warner Brothers. He's now working on a super secret unannounced AI project. Uh, he started in the games industry as a programmer on PC and Next Games in the early 90s, moving then on to consoles. He worked at the 3DO company and then EA as lead engineer, technical director, and then a CTO. He co-founded two startups uh, where he worked as technology and management lead, and he has a master's degree in uh, computer science where his uh, thesis tr was on the field of automated reasoning. Uh, and he's also the author of 3D graphics programming games and beyond. Uh, and he's had multiple articles and talks about AI games, development, management, production. So, one of the smartest people in this city, at least, when it comes to artificial intelligence. On the show, we spoke about why people are excited about AI, what's real, what is hype, the distinction between general AI and narrow AI, some of the use cases for, for businesses today, uh, the technical limitations, a really interesting uh, conversation about creativity and how that comes into play, and then a little bit of background on the stealth project that he's working on. I'm super excited to bring to you this episode, uh, which is a great conversation with Sergey Martin and myself. I, th I think it's a very important uh, area of growth. 2017 has been a seminal year for the industry. Uh, so that's why I felt it was important to really go in at a fundamental level to, to understand what's possible. So I hope that you enjoy the conversation. Sergey, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me here. Uh, really happy that you could take the time and, and talk about a uh, an important subject, one that we hear about more and more, especially, I guess, in this market, right. one of uh, artificial intelligence. And it's become a bit of a buzzword and I'm a fan slash not fan <laughs> of, <laughs> of the topic. Uh, I'm obviously here with my partner in crime, Martin, as well. Um, I guess maybe as a first question, so why, in your estimation, given your, your deep background in this field, why are we talking about this subject so much today? Right. So uh, maybe stepping back a little bit, uh, my background indeed has to do with AI. My master's was in automated reasoning, and I've done a bunch of work when it was still not called necessarily artificial intelligence in the 90s. Usually we had different names for the same things, like expert systems and so on. So um, what is happening today, obviously, it's super interesting because of all the computational advances, just how much hardware memory we have, a lot of techniques that people were looking at for many years, starting from 70s, are finally becoming to, to click a little bit. So that is uh, a bit of game changer for a fairly particular set of problems. Like, for instance, all the problems where we're trying to perceive some sort of a natural phenomena, like, for instance, set of pictures or something else like uh, autonomous vehicles and stuff. So a lot of those problems are finally getting resolved in a somewhat of a sane amount of investment and cost, right? At the same time, obviously, AI has a bit of a checkered history because in the 70s, it was super popular. A lot of things were claimed. Not a whole lot of things were realized. Uh, amount of investment in the 80s dropped dramatically. And then in the 90s, people were doing a lot of things, but not necessarily calling it as artificial intelligence. There was a whole lot of different set of terms for that from expert systems and then following into some subsets like be it fuzzy logic, be it evolutionary computing, be it data mining and so on. So, uh, and obviously we're in the situation where it's important also not to overhype what exactly is uh, achievable by the current set of advances. And obviously the interesting thing about AI is that it's uh it's an incredibly 
complicated moving target because psychologically, whenever we're getting to a point where we're able to set a able to solve a particular set of problems, suddenly it stops being AI. Like for instance, <laughs> if somebody in early 20s or 30s would have built an automaton that was able to play chess, that would have been incredible, right? But now that it's doable and basically the level of uh, computers playing chess or even more complicated game like Go is so high that it beats routinely human players, suddenly it's not being considered all, much, all that much of an artificial intelligence because we kind of have a particular set of techniques for that. So, and that was the history of AI as well. And we're probably getting to the same situation now. Like for instance, uh, everyone has a camera or a phone in their pocket and it can detect faces, right? Again, 20, 30 years ago, that would have been incredible. Now it's sort of, we take it for granted. So uh, all in all, maybe to summarize a little bit, certainly there are a lot of cool advances that are happening, but also the claims that people are making, especially related to general intelligence, over sometimes probably too far-reaching. Interesting. I, I want to get back to uh, something that you mentioned uh, uh, earlier, which is, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, they used to call it expert systems. Right. Um, would it be fair to say that the only difference between what was happening then and now is a brute force approach, which is just more computing power, you know, applied to the same algorithms, which aren't that much more intelligent? Um, well, yes, you know, there, there are a bunch of new techniques that were not necessarily all that popular in the nineties. I mean, my background is more in symbolic computation, like automated reasoning, where it's based on somewhat of a solid mathematics of, of reasoning and logic and so on. Uh, however, that is not tremendously good tool set for a lot of, you know, real life problems that we considered intelligent, right? So what is happening now is that this is being used as a subset of uh, tools for some particular problems. It's still being used quite a bit. But also there's all, all new set of tools like neural networks were yeah. a bit of a dirty name in the 90s for a variety of reasons. Yeah. But because of computational power, but also because of it was put on a better mathematical base uh, maybe 10 years ago. This is uh, a better set of uh, better set of tools. So it's not just there. There are certainly some advances which are not. Uh, strictly speaking, the same thing under a different label. But at the same time, w if you look at what is being solved practically in today's business, like autonomous vehicles, right? So it's not necessarily based on deep learning techniques and people are trying right. to apply it, but yeah. like commercial solutions are usually have fairly specific computer vision techniques and like techniques stemming from robotics and so on that are Solving those problems very, very well, like rivaling humans, basically, in certain tasks. Same applies for natural language processing. There is some deep learning that's being used for that, but also some older techniques that are becoming very, very efficient for translation, for, for other things, speech recognition. So uh, I think that's an important thing not to overlook is that while there's a lot of money flowing into the deep learning specifically, as having to do with different kinds of neural networks, recurrent neural networks, and so on. But at the same time, there is a lot of advances in other fields and techniques which are just as powerful and that are oftentimes more suitable for business and, and for practical use. Interesting. Interesting. I think there's a, it's kind of, kind of tied to this common, um, or reminds me of this common misconception of the public. If you, the, the, I think the general public's perception when you talk about AI is what they see in the movies. Uh, so anyone that right. doesn't work in tech, you know, you talk about AI and how it's going to steal everyone's job. They, they think about, you know, uh, Jar Jarvis and Iron Man and, and, uh, and Hal right. and, and, you know, Space Odyssey. Exactly. Um, what's your perspective on where we're actually at um, between, you know, zero being nothing and a hundred being, you know, Jarvis? Uh, right. per personally, my, my, you know, I'll, I'll show my cards. I think, Personally, we're probably at 15 on 100. Um, I, I played around with a few um, a few uh, chatbots that are supposed to be uh, best in class at the at the Turing test, and we're so not even close to anything, you know, of of that type of promise. What's what's your take on that? Yeah, I think um, just the actual problem, like of general intelligence, that we're facing ultimately in this field is so 
enormous that it's yeah. even very difficult to understand where we are. And I think that's what happened in the seventies when people were claiming that, well, we're kind of near and, you know, in five years, 10 years, we'll be living with those kind of Jarvis like devices or whatever. But, uh, uh, every time where advances are made, we realize, well, how much we cannot do and how much we don't know. So s- same here. I think we're uh, getting really good at very specific kind of problems, yeah. right? Yeah. Recognizing images, classifying images, uh, you know, translating everything which is more or less understood, like what is supposed to be input, what is supposed to be output. And techniques are different. Some Sometimes you have... Uh, expert knowledge and you can build something based on that. Sometimes you have a lot of uh, samples, like billions of samples that you can derive some uh, classifier out of being using different techniques. So we're super good at those things. But then uh, when it comes to a higher level, that's where things become really complicated. But still, it's a very interesting thing to look at. I think for me, it's two two different things that are kind of showing a promise. One is uh, IBM research for Watson, right? So, okay, it played Jeopardy. Maybe it's like not super applicable for what is happening in real life. But at the same time, how they did it by essentially having several dozens of different algorithms working in parallel mm-hmm. and then scoring which one is more suitable for that particular question, it is interesting, right? The other thing that is interesting is also how to, uh, some deep learning techniques are being used not necessarily for just classification, but for essentially some, you can say, machine creativity where you can kind of run the network in the opposite direction and produce instances that never existed in the first place. Hmm. So those kind of show some some promise, but at the same time, I think... To your earlier point, is it 15%, 20%, or 10%? It's really hard to say, but it's certainly way less than 50 Okay, that's so. interesting. Maybe I'll chime in and hear you guys speak, and it's like my mind's going to explode. Um, what does it mean? Like, so if I understand, obviously, we're nowhere near when it comes to general intelligence, at least what you guys are saying. You know, other, other people are saying differently, but it seems like we're very, very far. So right now, if we, we look at just narrow intelligence, so, so mm-hmm. specific use cases, machine vision, let's say when it comes to autonomous vehicles, you know, yesterday, Google's announcement about like, you know, real time translation. So a lot of these things are starting to permit a lot of different use cases. So I almost feel like you don't need to have general intelligence for for this to appear to be magical, right? Like real time right. translation is a very specific use case, yeah. and it's you know potential game changer, right? So do we even care basically about general intelligence? Because we can we can basically replicate these kind of techniques in many many different fields. So is it almost a, like what I'm trying to figure out is that the conversation around general intelligence is just irrelevant at this point? Well, I think it's relevant in academia, probably somewhat of less relevant thing in a business. I mean, from a business perspective, I think the important things to look at is, you know, what exactly does it help with? And I think there are two, two different, uh, kind of viewpoints to look at it. One is, uh, well, how to reduce the cost within using those techniques, right? Be it by, uh, you know, essentially avoiding having having to have headcount where you can automate something, right? So this is one. But also another thing that is also interesting is to try to explore things that the business wouldn't have been able necessarily to take advantage of. For instance, mining data and discovering something that your customer base may be looking for, but you weren't even aware that this is this is a need. So in a way it can be used easier to for better efficiency. Or it can be used to discover something that hasn't been tackled yet. And I think, uh, probably a more narrow and practical view of what are, what is the tool set of different things is an important one in that, right? Like, obviously, if we have, if somebody has a logistics company and has a completely autonomous fleet, well, there'll be savings, but also what does it mean for the business? Like, what kind of people do you need to have? And certainly you need to maintain that thing. And that's a complex, set of uh set of hardware to to drive right yeah yeah I, and although i i, I was listening to, to nectar's question I, I kind of agree and disagree with what you guys are saying um and I, i'd like to get your take on it so what you call narrow intelligence to me is just 
applying uh, big data and mathematics and, and statistics to massive, massive sets of data. Sometimes the algorithm gets better at what it does. But it's, it's, it's this like weird pet peeve of mine of, of word usage. And it's, to me, that's not intelligence. To me, intelligence is, is self-awareness. And that's where things get really, really interesting. And I think right. that's where I kind of disconnect with the hype. Um, yeah. And I think to the contrary, that this is where I disagree. I think that's where the real business breakthrough is going to happen. We might not see it <laughs> in our lifetimes, but um, you can just imagine like the, the potential, right? When a machine has self-awareness, has creativity, can start problem solving the way a human brain works. I mean, that that vision gets scary. And I, a lot of uh, well-known people have expressed their, their fear of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, again, I don't know what kind of time frame we're talking about here, but uh, to me, that's that's true AI, and uh, that's that's where I, I placed my you know my, my 15%. Uh, right. It, that might even be generous, but um, but I do agree. Again, this is the part where I agree is the 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 potential of applied narrow intelligence is what you called it uh, earlier to existing business is absolutely massive, and I think that's where the hype is is real. Yeah, and it's basically overlooking it is is dangerous because yeah. everyone is is going to reduce the cost structure by using a bunch of things that are fairly you know ready for 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 the real life. And there's like plenty of players that are, that have very solid solutions, be it again for autonomous vehicles, be it for for translation, or even you know for for assistant assistance because like you look at what. Apple is doing, or Microsoft is doing, or Google is doing, and it's getting better. And it's like, obviously, this is not something new. It existed in the 90s. It existed to some extent in the late 80s, but no one was taking it seriously. It was more toys. Now it becomes just because of it's so prevalent in, in everybody's pocket. I think uh, as those assistants are getting better and they'll get smarter and they'll be more part of the real life. And I think the trick about general intelligence is like, it's very hard to say where it's like, well, if we call it simple intelligence ends and where the general intelligence begins, what's this threshold, right? So, uh, again, because, again, psychologically, whenever something is solvable, suddenly we have a tendency not to consider that super intelligent anymore, but that might be a bit of a cognitive bias to do that. Okay, so it looks like we have an agreement that, you know, even if it's maybe not the right word, according to Martin, it doesn't seem to like it. <laughs> Narrow challenges is maybe the, the best use case today of what, right. what is applicable for a business. So if you are a blue chip company, um, how do you approach it? What is the, what is the decision tree look like? Like, is it, um, yeah, like how do you just tackle the problem, right? It's a bit of a buzz, but how, what are the first kind of questions you should be asking yourself? Mm. Well, I think um, there definitely should be a bit of a decision tree. One is, I think, understanding where the domain knowledge is, right? What is the domain knowledge of a particular company? Is it kind of embodied in human experts? Is it embodied in, you know, some artifacts, documents, or something else that exists? Because that'll drive uh, a bunch of decision-making in practical terms, right? If it's like the way you do business is really only your sales force or your engineers or whatever understand what, what is it about, uh, you know, you'll need to, if you want to automate it, uh, the techniques that you'd use probably would rely on, it's like making some symbolic representation of this knowledge and doing something out of that. On the other hand, if you have millions of customers, be it as if you're a social network or whatever, suddenly the knowledge that you have is represented uh, in a somewhat of a distributed fashion through the data of individual users, what they create, what they use on a daily basis, so that suddenly a different set of techniques become available to you. But again, I think uh, there is always a bit of a balancing act. What, as a business, what are you focusing on? Is it purely tactical and reducing costs right away, or is it a longer-term investment where you would need to run a bit of an R&D? So... Depending on your size, probably it's worthwhile to do both and have different set of people looking at, you know, tactically what we can take advantage of today. And then strategically, three years, five years from now, what can we, what we can also do? Right. So, but ultimately it does come down to, to having people who care about those things. And if they care about things, they'll learn about it and understand about it more. So I think that's what, what is super important as well. Uh, interesting. Interesting. Um, another thing uh, that I'd like to get your thoughts on is 
how would you compare um, narrow intelligence or <laughs> whatever we're calling it yeah. now? <laughs> uh, the implementation in the business. Sub intelligence. So, yeah, so, some intelligence. Uh, I I like to compare it to uh, it's 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 obviously it's very promising. It could save a lot of companies, most likely billions of dollars, and they're not exploiting it today. It's very new. People are kind of afraid of it. You could draw a parallel with kind of uh, PCs in early 80s, I guess, uh, very late 70s or early 80s. Uh, and I remember, you know, my parents telling me about how, how they came and in, in, in the businesses that, that they worked at. And it's like everyone kind of knew that they could be saving a lot of money, but it's a big investment. It's a lot of change. There's apprehension. Where do you think we are in, in terms of that timeline? Because it will come, right? It's kind of inevitable. Um, so what's, what's your what's your take on that? I think it'll be somewhat, depending on on the field, obviously, it'll come at a different pace. There are some, uh, just some industries that are somewhat more advanced in this respect, just because they're dealing with technology more. Certainly people who are it's like web enabled and have a lot of customers and there's like, I think, better exposure to what is happening. And then there's a lot of traditional businesses that just by the nature of their markets, they're somewhat... Uh, I shouldn't say behind, but it's just less relevant uh, to them. So I think it'll come at a different pace, but certainly uh, a lot of advances that are happening would happen relatively quickly. I think within five, 10 years, we will see a changing landscape in terms of how custom relationship is being done for many companies. I mean, we're seeing it already, right? But it'll be only only more of that. Is it going to be f- happening in your local bakery? Probably not, but, <laughs> but, uh, even that, like you look at what people are doing with like automated kitchens and stuff. So this is also something that I think will happen in our lifetime. That's for sure. What do you think is happening in the space uh, that no one is talking about? Hmm. Um, I don't know. Again, I mean, I'm personally excited about certain things <clears throat> more, particularly because for for psychological reasons, for, for other reasons, some we we tend to value, let's say, creativity, right? Like I worked a lot in in video games and creativity is a bit of a dirty word, I guess, in, in that field, but this is something that everyone deals with. So uh, we tend to value it as something extremely human, right? And then you see uh, how some Artifacts are being produced automatically, generated automatically, but they're interesting. Like in human terms, they're interesting. You look at that. So I think, I'm not saying no one is talking about it. I think there's actually a lot of people are talking about that. And you see, you know, whatever Google is doing with images and stuff like that. So, but for me, this is kind of interesting because it leads towards something that I don't think we saw previously to that scale, right? So all of the kind of Generative intelligence advances are again interesting for me personally, um, but um, ultimately, yeah, I don't know. Hard, hard to say what no one is talking about. Uh, so, just to be clear, the example you're referring to is, um, for instance, the uh, uh, you know dreams in the machine, for instance, that Google released. Right. right? So th- those kinds of yeah. quote unquote creativity, which there is, there has, there is some yeah. creativity in it, right? So that's exactly. what you're referring to. Other applications, be it in music uh, or images, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and I, I, yeah. I think it uh, it it certainly can change uh, how a bunch of things are being done. Let's say how applicable or how soon is going to be applicable for fields like advertisement, right? I think it's already happening to some extent, and people should be looking at it more. You know how to you know, basically generate things using some out of uh, assisted techniques and automated techniques that I still remain interesting to humans, right? What do you think is left to solve? Like, what are the biggest technical barriers? Because right now it seems like it's a, it's a brute force approach plus a lot of data. Uh, so the recursive algorithms plus data, essentially. <clears throat> um, what do you think are the biggest technical constraints for it to, to advance faster? I think there are many schools of thought on that. Some people would say that it's purely computational scale problem that as soon as, you know, our computing resources and memory would increase tenfold, hundredfold, thousandfold, suddenly, you know, a lot of things that 
like kind of emergent in that saying would become more meaningful and that would lead to intelligence at a higher level, be it general intelligence or subgeneral intelligence, whatever we call it. So there is certainly a school of thought of that. And that's why, you know, we should just continue. I mean, the techniques that are being used for that have some issues. Like obviously there are some interesting papers written about how by jittering a little bit of the input, your classifier suddenly becomes fairly unstable or, yeah. you know, how to explain reasoning. Like, let's say if you're, a network does something, I mean, how do you know that it, it's it's uh, valid logically, yeah. whatever logic we're apply, applying for that? So, but in a way, there's a school of thought that it's just purely computational computational problems. There are the people who would consider that is probably false, and we lack uh, basically that other kinds of reasoning and representation of the external world because, like, let's, you know... So, okay, we're we're using human intelligence as a bit of a uh, comparison point here, but human intelligence has flaws as well. You know, there's research sure. about yeah. cognitive biases and different things, how we perceive things, how we make decisions, and it's flawed in many ways. But at the same time, we do possess uh, predictive ability and some representational understanding of the world, which is not something that you can easily... Uh, I mean, there is a lot of research and different things and different techniques, but it's not something that uh, is a solved problem to in in many ways. And again, some people would say, well, it's a scale of computation problem. And some people would say, well, we're lacking language technique tools to to do that. I tend to think the latter. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to hear that because I, I, I totally agree. Um, so basically, like, option one is a uh, brute force. And right. option two is... As long as it's CPUs counting ones and zeros, uh, there's going to be certain limitations. And uh, very interesting point about human intelligence being flawed because a lot of people think it's necessary to replicate true AI, uh, to have feelings and emotion and, and, and spontaneousness. <clears throat> and like those are the things that make yeah. our interpretation of true intelligence intelligence. So yeah. if that's the definition, then again, by definition, a machine doesn't make mistakes, right? It, it follows instructions and it doesn't, it doesn't really, it'll make mistakes if you program it to make mistakes, mm. right? So it's a, it's a very, very, very interesting uh, debate. Yeah. And it's, it's a bit of a contradiction in terms like on one hand, by definition, artificial intelligence is something that <laughs> a human would consider the intelligence with all yeah. the flaws that we have. But on the other hand, do we want that thing to be flawed because ultimately we'll be relying on it to drive or to do whatever. So in some ways we want it to be <laughs> better than a human, right? So maybe to shift gears a little bit, um, you're obviously working on a stealth project that we can't talk about right. a lot. <laughs> But we could talk about a little bit. Maybe you can. It is obviously related to the conversation yeah. we're having. So maybe give us a bit of background on, on what this AI project is about. Sure. So I mean, once again, I mean, I've been fascinated by AI, and that's why I did my master's in that. And I've been kind of following the field for, for all of those years, even though most of my kind of practical work experience was kind of in video games, where also there is AI and everything else. And kind of fairly recently, I decided to shift the gears a little bit and uh, started to, with obviously partnership and uh, to, to work on something that is is really cool. So it's uh, basically trying to build systems that would, in a very practical way, uh, aid businesses, small, medium businesses to essentially automate their legal needs. Uh, things like legal document creation, but also getting contextual legal information for the needs that they have. So, uh, and again, it relies on a lot of things. Uh, first and foremost, it needs to be practical. It needs to produce practical value soon. So obviously, uh, there's only so many uh, research papers that are somewhat out there that we can apply at this point. But at the same time, uh, things like you know, uh, natural language processing and things like reasoning and things like, well, how to represent information for a specific domain, legal domain. This is all the things that we're working on. And we have a lot of exciting things that I'm certainly hoping within fairly short time to be able to, uh, to speak about. Okay. So you're teasing us a little bit. Um, right. I'm when, to... how, you know, how much time can you come back and be a guest and, and deep dive on, on what you're working on? Uh, okay. That's putting me on the spot a little bit. Well, you know, like early next year. How about okay. that? Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Uh, want to be respectful of your time, Sergey. Really good chat. I think I, I personally learned a lot. Um, maybe just a general last question. Like, what are you most excited about in the field um, right now? Mm. 
Well, as I said, I mean, for me, it's this sort of computational creativity is kind of interesting in, in many, many ways. And it has to do, there's like different aspects of that, be it uh, generating automated narratives and be it generated automated imagery, be it, uh, you know, it's like conversations. I think that's, that's where uh, it certainly excites me because it sort of, it's like shows the path a little bit. And yeah, it has to do not just with math of it or computer science of it. It also has to do with a lot of human psychology of that. And that's what makes it quite, quite interesting. And in general, I think it's like we spoke about it, touching it multiple times in this conversation, but overlooking human aspect and human psychology aspect when we're dealing with AI is, is deeply flawed because you know, the users of that are human and we have a particular way of approaching and thinking about things and we cannot disregard that. Amazing, Sergey. Thank you so much for your time. No, thank you. Uh, we're looking forward to having you back very soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Point of No Return podcast. Never miss an episode by clicking on the subscribe button on iTunes or Google Play.